You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of our Lord. The second lesson is written in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. We have been freed from slavery, just like the Israelites were. Slavery to sin and death and the devil himself. But we don't want to become slaves again. Rather, in grateful love, we obey our, our Lord, who, saved, who served us and who saved us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. This is the word of our Lord. His disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. In honor of our Lord, whose words and deeds we see and hear in the gospel, we stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. We just heard the third commandment. God says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. God expects and desires his people to worship him with glad and sincere hearts. But we see in the first lesson that people were preventing others from doing just that as they set up uh, mer merchandise to sell and changing money within the temple itself. We see how serious God is about his law as Jesus casts those merchants and money changers out of the temple. May we ever draw near to God's temple with glad and sincere hearts. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated for our next one. <laughs>
sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God's word for our meditation this morning is the first lesson from Exodus chapter 20. God gives his holy law to his people at Mount Sinai. And God spoke all these words. This is the word of our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, our holy and loving Lord and Savior. It was a strange, dark, and dreadful day. A day like no other day ever. Thick clouds covered the mountain so that it obscured its slopes. Lightning would, would frequently slash through those thick clouds accompanied by deafening thunder. Besides the thick clouds around the mountain, smoke billowed up from that mountain as if there were some weird, huge blast furnace. The ground shook violently. A trumpet could be heard, first soft, and then getting louder and louder and louder. And as if all of that wasn't ominous enough, God himself had given a command that anyone who so much as touched that mountain would be put to death instantly. Man or beast, no questions asked. That was a dark and dreadful day. A day like any no other day. That day at Mount Sinai when God gave his law, his ten commandments. Imagine what that setting would have done to those Israelites who would be the first to hear the commandments of God inscribed by God's own hand in tablets of stone. Imagine you being there, seeing the mountain covered with smoke and clouds, hearing the, the, the roar of thunder and feeling the ground shaking beneath you. You think you might be motivated to listen to what God had to say. You think you might be wanting to obey what this God, this God of, of power and might and thunder and lightning and earthquakes had to say to you. You better believe it. So one might think that God would have begun his list of rules, his commandments, with a statement that said something like, I am the all-powerful creator of the universe. I made everything out of nothing, and I can destroy everything, including all who dare to disobey me. So you would be wise to listen to what I have to say, and you would be foolish to not obey what I command. He could have started that way, but he didn't. Instead, here is, is how God began his commandments. He said to his people, I am the Lord. That probably doesn't have the same impact as we hear that name Lord as it would have to the people of the Old Testament. You see, God has a lot of different names for himself in the Bible. He could have said, I am El Shaddai. There's one Hebrew name for God, a name that, that basically says, I am the all-powerful God. But he used this name in Hebrew, Yahweh, Lord. That was his special name, a name that said to his people, I am the God of free and full forgiveness and mercy. That was his covenant name, the name where he said, I'm making a promise of mercy and grace to you. That's how he began. 
But he didn't stop there. He didn't merely say, I am the Lord, this God who makes this covenant of grace with you. He went on to say this. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Before telling his people what he was commanding them to do for him, he reminded them of what he had done for them. For generations, the Israelites had been held in bondage, in slavery in Egypt. But God hadn't forgotten about them. He remembered his people. He had mercy on his people. He stooped down from his throne in heaven, and by his powerful and merciful outstretched arm, he rescued them. He freed them from their slavery and was leading them to their homeland. So what God was doing there was shaping their motivation in obedience to his commands. Rather than being motivated by fear of punishment and destruction by God for disobeying him, God desired people who obeyed him out of genuine love and gratitude. He didn't want his people cowering in fear of him. He wanted them to walk with him as their savior. He didn't want people who would obey him like a slave obeying a master because they're afraid of being punished. He wanted children who obeyed him out of gratitude and love and willing obedience. And that's why he started his list of the commandments by saying, I am the Lord your God who freed you from slavery. God still wants his people to obey him. And Lent is a reminder of that call to obedience. Lent with its emphasis on repentance, on our sins, on God's expectations of us. Lent calls us to obey. But Lent also points us to Jesus as our Savior. Lent focuses us on the cross, where we see the full extent of his love for us. God began the Ten Commandments by reminding his people of Israel that he was the one who had freed them from slavery. Lent also reminds us that our Lord is the one who's freed us from slavery too. Slavery to sin, slavery to death, slavery to fear, slavery to the devil, slavery to hell. But Jesus, by his blood at the cross, has freed us. We're free. God gave his son to be our savior. Jesus gave his life to pay for our sins. The Holy Spirit has given us faith that connects us to him. And now we are truly free. We're free from fear, free from guilt, free to obey, free to serve. Lent calls us to obey, to obey God whose commandments are not mere suggestions. But Lent reminds us that our motivation in obeying our God love that he has for us and our love for him who did everything for us and freed us from our sins. But there's another aspect to our obedience that Lent calls us to. We obey out of genuine love and gratitude, but we also obey because we don't want to become slaves again. We don't want to do what the Israelites did in the Old Testament. They at least threatened to allow themselves to become enslaved once more. It happened on multiple occasions. They would complain and gripe and grumble against God as they made their way through the wilderness to the promised land and threatened to go back to Egypt. They said, we had it better when we were slaves. Let's just go back again. Can you imagine how ridiculous that was? 
They were free. They had a horrible life. But we don't do anything really different than that ourselves. We, like the Old Testament Israelis, Israelites, are acting like we want to be slaves again when we willingly, knowingly, repeatedly disobey our God. It's as if we want to become slaves to sin and the devil once more, even though we've been set free. A quick review of the Ten Commandments, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, will reveal just how tempting it is for us and how close we come so often to enslaving ourselves again to sin. Just do a quick review with me. God says in the First Commandment, you shall have no other gods. But when we let the pursuit of money or the love of pleasure push God out of first place in our lives, we're enslaving ourselves once again. God says in the second commandment, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. But when we pepper our everyday conversations with God's name, in a meaningless way, or intersperse the letters OMG in our text messages, we're misusing that name, that holy, sacred name, as if we want to enslave ourselves once again. The third commandment says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. But when we come to God's house, to hear his word or study his word together with others or read the Bible ourselves, if we do that so infrequently or so reluctantly, we're threatening to become slaves again to sin. The fourth commandment says, honor your father and your mother, as well as all others that God has placed in authority over us, but when we are disrespectful to those in authority like the government, we're enslaving ourselves again. The fifth commandment says, you shall not murder. We shall not hurt or harm anyone. And that includes ourselves. And yet when we don't take care of ourselves, when we abuse our own bodies by frequent and willful abuse of substances or not taking care of ourselves, we're enslaving ourselves. The sixth commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. But when we act as if sex is basically a normal and expected part of dating, rather than something that God himself reserves for between only a husband and wife joined together in a promise of faithfulness, or if we treat viewing pornography as entertainment, we're enslaving ourselves once more. The seventh commandment says, you shall not steal. But when we find ourselves gladly cashing our paychecks and yet giving far less than our full effort for our employer, we're stealing from them and we're enslaving ourselves. The Eighth Commandment says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, but when we so eagerly want to share gossip, tearing other people down instead of building each other up, guess what? We're enslaving ourselves once again to sin. The ninth and the tenth commandments say, don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And yet, when we allow ourselves to wallow in envy of blessings God has given to other people, rather than being appreciative and enjoying the blessings he's given to us, you guess it, we're becoming slaves again. Now you know, and I know, and God knows that we will never, ever, in the sight of heaven, be able to live perfectly according to his will. We will always sin. That's because we inherited a, a, a human nature that includes sin in it. We got it from our parents, and they got it from their parents, and they went all the way back to our first parents who sinned against God. Our love for God and our service for each other will never be perfect. And yet, love and service are never optional. 
we strive to obey our God out of genuine love and gratitude, not fear of him and fear of his punishment. And yet we also recognize that willful and continued disobedience of God is pushing him out of our lives and enslaving ourselves once more. Slavery in Egypt meant a lifetime of, of misery. Slavery to sin ultimately would mean an eternity of misery separated from our God. It was a dark and dreadful day, that day at Mount Sinai when God gave his law. It was a dark and dreadful day, that day at Mount Calvary when Jesus gave his life out of love for the Savior who gave his life for us and freed us from slavery to sin and death and the devil, who freed us to be his own forever. We listen and we obey. Let's call to obedience. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Please stand. Let's join in confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find that at the top of page 18. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified and our conscious Bible. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us also join in offering our prayers. We pray responsibly the prayer of the church. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your Son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly gift. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. We will pray for those who need and to help them with Jesus Christ. Hear us, Lord, as
as we bring you our private petitions. <clears throat> Finally, Lord, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home, where we will stand in the full light of your glory, and with all your saints and angels sing the everlasting song of triumph. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He made his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. <laughs> saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod to not join us for Lord's Supper this morning. We're not trying to judge your faith. But we do want you to have the opportunity to find out if you are one in faith with us before you would express that by joining us and taking part in the sacrament with us. We'd love for that to happen. If you're interested in finding out what steps you might take toward that, please talk to me after the service. For those of you who will be joining us in partaking of Christ's body and blood, come forward at the direction of the usher. God bless your reception of Christ's body and blood.
Please stand as we join in singing. Thank you. Sunday we'll gather for our celebration of Christ's resurrection, normal church time of 10 a.m., uh, but there will be a Easter brunch afterwards, and there is a sign-up sheet for that brunch on the bulletin board, so please sign up for a wish to cast for that on, on, on Easter Sunday. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to share with us this morning? Yes, quite. Uh, just a few updates from the council meeting. Uh, so we had our monthly council meeting just a few days ago, so I just wanted to give everybody a few updates on that. Uh, there will be an email coming out probably later today with some more info, but um, our work day was scheduled for the Saturday before Holy Week, so I think that's the 23rd? 23rd sounds right. Um, we're going to make that pretty much just an indoor work day. I don't know how much the snow will be gone by then. And then we'll do a, more of an outdoor work day sometime in April. Um, 
but we'll keep you posted on that and different projects we'll be working on there. Um, one of the projects that's going to be done, um, but don't worry, we're not going to ask our members to do it, is replacing our boiler. Um, so we have funds ready for that. We're getting them liquidated out of an account so that we can pay for that. We're getting a couple of quotes right now from different people um, just to know how much that'll cost. But the boiler is we've kind of been waiting for it to die now, so we're just going to proactively get it replaced here once uh, winter's kind of over. Uh, BBS is coming up quicker than you might believe. It's June 10th to 13th. Yep. June 10th to 13th. Um, I think we have enough people who volunteered for housing, but we're still looking for transportation and then activities for the students coming as well. We have seven students and one chaperone coming from Wisconsin Lutheran High School to help out. Um, and really all we have to do is provide transportation, housing, and maybe a few meals for them. So if anybody wants to help out or has an idea for something they can go do in the afternoons or they have a couple other days they're here where we're not doing BBS, um, talk with me, talk with Pastor, and we'll get that figured out as well. Um, there's a new cleaner treater schedule posted out there uh, for the next couple of months. Uh, if there's any issues, any conflicts with that, let me know and we can get that figured out. Um, like Pastor said, the Easter potluck sign up as well. And then there's going to be, once I can figure out how to format it, a list as well of all the events that we're doing throughout the rest of the year. Um, so dates for them and a sign up place to sign up um, if you want to help, if you want to bring something to help with it, if you want to kind of take charge and run with it a little bit, any of that. So that'll be posted next Sunday as well. And I believe that's all I've got. I'd like to send an email later with maybe a little more information. Um, but as always, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself pastor, any council member, um, any questions, comments, anything like that. We'd love to get feedback from everybody. So, thank you. Maybe just a quick add-on uh, about BBS. Um, I will have, I had asked for a, a you know, show of hands, but not a commitment to uh, hosting students. And so there's plenty of hands that went up, but I will now be putting up a, a, a sign-up sheet so that I get it in writing that you're going to be able to do that. Uh, as well as there'll be, there will be some volunteer positions that we'll need. Um, they'll do the heavy lifting, but, but we'll need to, with registration, with, with um, crafts, and with uh, like uh, snacks and stuff, we'll, we'll need some help. So look for that coming up. Hopefully this next week I'll have it up there. Uh, but I did contact the um, uh, chaperone that's coming with them. Just to get, I didn't know how many guys and how many girls there would be, but just that we'd have seven students. They are graduating seniors. There are four guys and three girls, plus the uh, male uh, chaperone who's a teacher at, at, at MISCO. Um, so think about that. If you are one that's inclined or you'd already said, hey, I think we can use one, two, three, whatever, uh, if you had a preference like, okay, it would work out better with my situation to have two guys or whatever. So, so I'll put that on there, but just keep, keep that in mind. Think about that as you uh, reflect on whether or not you want to be somebody who can do that. God bless you this week. Thank mm -hmm. you.